Well, hello, everyone. Happy New Year. It's only January the 11th, so it's plenty of perfectly appropriate to wish everybody a happy new year. And after the one we just went through, we could all use one, couldn't we? So uh, we do a lot of serious history in these episodes, uh, but I thought we'd do something a little more lighter today, if you will, uh, to start the year off with maybe a little bit of humor. And why not? We could all use some humor. Uh, so today's episode is going to involve the game of skee-ball. All right. And I want to show of hands, uh, who in the audience marching has played skee-ball? Hands up. Come on. All right. I mean, I played it, my kids have played it, my grandkids have played it, I mean, my siblings have all played it, everybody I know has played skee-ball, I'm betting that almost everybody else has too, so. But who would have guessed that there was a connection between skee-ball and the Union League of Philadelphia? I wouldn't have, but there is, so let's get into the story itself. All right, so I'm going to do my usual share screen so I can show my PowerPoint. Okay. All right, we've got that, and then I've got to do this thing up here. We hit that, and once again, it worked. Dog. Okay. All right. So, ski ball in the Union League. All right. Let's get going. All right. So, our story begins in Vineland, New Jersey, of all places. Let's have a shout out for Vineland. All right. I'm sure there are a number of members who live in Vineland in the area around it. So, uh, the date was December the 8th of 1908, because on that day, Joseph Fressier Simpson received a patent for his new game. That's all it was just a game. All right, but it would become known as ski ball. So, uh, in early 1909, uh, Simpson, uh, knowing he needs help to get this new invention moving, uh, hires two colleagues uh, as his business partners, a fellow named John Harper and then William Nice. And the three of them together would do their best to improve the marketing so they could sell the ball. After all, it, if nobody knows you have it, you can't sell it. So, this was the very first ad that appeared in uh, Billboard magazine in April of 1909. And you can see they get to call it Ski Ball Bowling. And that's it. And you can see, but it's already based in Philadelphia now. It's called Ski Ball Alley Company, Philadelphia, PA. All right, so let's see what's next. Okay, this is how they described it, or at least how popular mechanics described it. And who would have thought that popular mechanics would do something like this? So Ski Ball Bowling, in which the ball is jumped or skied into the pocket the same manner as a ski jumper rises from the bump in his flight, is a new and unique handball game that seems destined to great popularity. Was it? Did it? Oh, well, clearly it's still around, so yes, but it wasn't an easy road. So let's go see what happens, okay? Now, this is what a Ski Ball Alley looked like. And Believe it or not, that is 32 feet long. Okay. Uh, it's like a bowling alley itself. So in, effect, in effect, it is, but with a different uh, aspect of the game itself. You can see the ball in midair going towards uh, the holes on the far right-hand side. So it's so 32 feet long, and hence it was called an alley. Okay. And what did you throw or roll down that alley? Wooden balls, and that's what they looked like. Okay. Obviously, today we don't use wood, but back then they did. So that's how it all started. And so uh, by the middle of 1909, the ski ball alley, the ski ball alley company is trying to get itself uh, known through marketing, and hopefully it becomes a popular game. And that's when this gentleman enters the picture. This is Charles Este, uh, who was a Union League member. All right. So. He was born in Dayton, Ohio in 1842. I think the family came from Philadelphia, an old uh, French family, and because they were around from the 18th century. Uh, and Charles' sister, by the way, was born in Philadelphia, so I think that's why I think they were originally a Philadelphia family. Uh, Charles was educated in France, Germany, and Switzerland, so obviously the family, upper middle class at the very least. Uh, he was in Philadelphia when the Civil War started, and he enlisted in the Philadelphia Gray Reserves, and everybody, every league member should know about the Great Reserves because we have two bronze sculptures representing their infantry and artillery on the Broad Street side of the building. All right. And uh, he then joined the 32nd Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Regiment. Uh, so he, he, he did his job in the war. In 1866, after the war, he started his own lumber company, the Charles S.T. Lumber Company, and it was located at 20th Street and Greenwood Avenue in what we think of today as North Philadelphia. But it was contiguous to the Pennsylvania Railroad Line, the New York Division that would take the Pennsylvania Railroad trains from Philadelphia to New York, and what we today think of as the Northeast Corridor. To give you some idea where that might have been. All right. So Charles Esty uh, had 
six children, three of whom survived into adulthood, but included two sons, Charles Jr. and Jonathan Dickinson. Uh, Charles Jr. would join the league in 1909, uh, but Dick, as Jonathan Dickinson was called, did not, unfortunately, because he's the guy who really kind of got things going. So, but nonetheless, still a league connection, right? So let's move on, all right? So, right now, this is Jonathan Dickinson estate in a way, and there's a reason why his middle name is Dickinson. That's because he was a, a direct descendant of the first president of Princeton University, Joseph Dickinson, and Jonathan Dickinson. And therefore, not unexpectedly, uh, he went to Princeton University. And that comes as a surprise to everybody, right? Okay, you can see that one coming. He graduated in 1909, all right, uh, just at the time when ski ball was coming around. And apparently Dickinson ran into it, uh, or Dick, as he was called, uh, became familiar with it as early as 1910. Uh, but it wasn't until 1913 that he really went deep in the weeds on it. But in the meantime, uh, regretfully, uh, in early January of 1910, William Nice died unexpectedly, leaving Harper and Simpson to manage the company themselves. And, and to be honest, they, they didn't do a good job. They were hardly selling any alleys. Uh, the company itself was on life support. And it wasn't going anywhere until Dick enters the story. And so it's 19, uh, 1913, he gets reacquainted with it, uh, and he decides to, take, to buy two alleys, uh, or maybe rent them, and he will, open, and he will uh, establish them in a little place just outside of uh, Princeton University, hoping that college, thinking that college students would love this kind of a game as a form of recreation away from all their hard studies and things like that. And it worked for a little while, but didn't really take off the way he thought. But nonetheless, though, he's still uh, being a bright young man. And at this point, he's working in his father's lumber company, as it is brother Charles. And, and Dick would become the treasurer eventually. So obviously a bright, smart guy, uh, entrepreneur at heart, it seems like. So, so uh, he gets to know Simpson and Harper. And by early 1914, he's negotiating to take over the company itself. And by May, at the cost of $40,000, he will purchase the patent and all other legal obligations to the game of skee ball. And he now becomes, he forms his own company called the JDSD Company. And it is now his. And that's, and that's when it really gets interesting. So the advantage of all this, of course, especially having a father in lumber business, is that he had access to lumber to build his alleys. And so he opened his plant uh, right across the street from his father's lumber yard. And his plant was at 20th and Cumberland in North Philadelphia. So he opened his corporate headquarters, if you will, just literally a block away from the league at 1534 Sampson Street in Philadelphia. So, so Dick is really going to make this thing take off. It's going to be really popular. And of course, the, the way to do that is one way to do it is to take it where people are having fun. And so he opened up a ski ball alley on the Atlantic City boardwalk. And from there, or at trolley parks and things like that. You know, think of Willow Grove Park. And I wouldn't doubt that they had a ski ball alley there, though. So, so that's how this game evolved and became popular, all right? So this is what the ski ball alley looked like. And you can see in the lower right-hand corner, ski ball alley company, 20th and Cumberland Streets in Philadelphia, all right? Pretty much the earlier description, but now you, have, you see that now there's a real good marketing campaign to get this game out into the public, all right? And this is what they would have looked like from that point in time, all right? So the Union League. All right, maybe through the influence of both uh, Dick's father and brother, uh, but on, in February of 1915, uh, the House Committee instructed the superintendent of the league, uh, that is the general manager of the day, to purchase a ski ball alley for no more than $375. That was a least piece of profit. So now where was it? I don't know, <laughs> because they didn't tell us. However, though, the bowling alleys, which needed almost the same kind of space, were located in what would be the northwest corner of the 1910 Trumbauer edition. Okay, that is the very west end of the, of the, of the clubhouse itself. So if you walk in the Sanson Street door and make a right, there's your fitness center. And if you go to the right inside the fitness center, into the corner, that's where the bowling alley was originally. And I'm, I'm sure that that's where the ski balls alley was set up as well. So unfortunately, they have no feedback from the league afterwards if it was successful or not. But again, you know, there were many other sports playing at the league. So members had many different um, uh, forms of recreation. So they had they had bowling, ping pong, they had uh, billiards and pool, cards, chess, and things like that. So 
the ski ball helped round out this uh, recreational component to the league membership, even back then. And here we are. This was an ad that was in Life magazine, and uh, it says, for the clubman. So he's obviously Dick's familiarity with the league through his father and his brother, you know, realized that this is a really, this is a niche where he could find sales for the game. So you can see the club men are all in black and in tuxedos. One Joe is even in white tie and tails. So, so you can see how he's marketing this game to different levels of society. There you go. I think that's a really great ad. All right. Now, uh, rather than keep throwing coins, that is money in the slots to make the game work, uh, Dick invented these coins. And so you, you get so much, so many coins for so much money and you use these coins instead to play the game. And that's how you got your balls to roll down the alley. So pretty neat stuff. And you can find them. They're available generally on eBay and stuff like that, if anybody's looking for them. But I like the fact that it's the GDSC company, Philadelphia PA. Good stuff there. All right. Okay. Now, JDFD. Let's go back to JDFD. Uh, there he is. You can see he's in uniform. That's because in 1917, he joined the Army Air Corps. And he went to France and would receive the, uh, a number of medals from the, uh, the Army Air Corps itself, the British Flying Cross and things like that. And when he came back after the war, he kind of lost his interest. And so in 1919, he would sell the company to various business partners and he would go off and do other things. But at this point, ski ball is now established as a national pastime, if you will. And that's the important thing. So let's go back to here. And you can see that eventually this partner sold it to the Werther Oregon Company in Chicago, believe it or not. They in turn sold it back to a Philadelphia company called the Philadelphia Toboggan Company. You can see it's east of Duval Street in Germantown. So if you're going, if you're driving out Germantown Avenue towards Chestnut Hill, Duval is on the east, Duval's on the right hand side in the Germantown neighborhood, very close to Mount Airy. They in turn would sell it to another group of investors in Philadelphia. And just in the last two or three years, it was sold to a company uh, outside of Green Bay, Wisconsin, in Pulaski, Wisconsin. And they are now making ski ball out there. So the game is still being played all over the place. And you can, you can actually play it digitally as well. So you can buy an app, a ski ball app and stuff like that. So it's a pretty good story, isn't it? So who would have thought that ski ball went from Vineland, New Jersey to Philadelphia with a nice Union League connection? You know, you never know, but that's what makes it fun. So one last thing. Um, I want to thank Thaddeus Cooper, uh, who... Oh, by now, four or five years ago, perhaps, uh, emailed me and said, hey, I'm doing this research on skee and I think there's a leak connection. Can you look into it for me? So with a little bit of digging, we found out some information. And Thaddeus uh, and his publishing partner, writing partner, Kevin Kreitman, wrote a book about, the, as you can see, the beautiful game of skee ball. So um, it's really a fun book. And uh, we'll, we'll have it in the library if anybody wants to read it. So, so that's the story for today. Uh, who would have who would have guessed? <laughs> I, I certainly wouldn't have, but I think it's a great story. And if you haven't played ski ball, go out and do it. It's a lot of fun. All right. So thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, I hope this gets us off to a good start for this new year. A uh, little bit of humor always helps, as I said. So, so thanks for being so such faithful uh, watchers of these video episodes. Hope you're enjoying them. And let's give a shout out to the Legacy Foundation uh, for thinking of these thinking of this in the first place. So we can all have some fun at least once a week. I hope. All right. Well, still a little crazy out there. So stay safe, everybody. Stay healthy and have a great new year. Thank you and goodbye.